along the line, all of a sudden it was a blackout in the gym. The lights went out, the fans shut off, and they were doing all kinds of switches. I was surprised for a while that our didn't have anything going on at the stage. <laughs> 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 I figured the signal would be here tonight. And they'll put a sleeve in the side. That'll be another three of them. And then they'll put the two in the side. Up front. Alright, alright. And so we're going to go down through. Oh, Fort Bay, that would be there's an open meetings poster on the wall. Take a look at it. So we'll have roll call. Shoka. Donovan. Here. Klein Schmidt. Here. Lightline. Yes. Maloney. Present. And then here, Oshner. Yes. Dunmire. Motion for declaration of the legal meeting. Second. My client's been seconded by Shalkoff that this regular meeting of November 10th be declared a legal meeting. Roll call. Blank Schmidt. Shalkoff. Yes. Donovan. Yes. Whitewine. Yes. Malobi. Yes. None yes. Oshner. Yes. Demeyer. Yes. <coughs> This is the portion of the meeting that we use for public comment. If someone would like to address the board, this would be the time to do it. Then we'll move into reports from the administration. Mr. Rose. Um, I won't spend much time on the report other than the uh, report that I gave you here. And I'll spend more time on the data information. Um, parent teachers conference didn't wasn't as good a turnout as we had in previous years or previous last year during down ten percent. But we'll try to look at ways of trying to get those other parents in and um, see if we can improve that number again next year. Had a nice veterans program this morning, well attended. Um, probably the other thing that I highlight is our FFA is going to be involved in a blood drive next spring. Uh, there seems to be more and more schools being involved. And kids being involved donating blood. So it's a good situation for a lot of, a lot of things. You'll find a, some data here, some information on our uh, these are scores, as well as the ITP in 9th and 11th grade, and also our ACT scores. The first page, and I won't go through all of them, but I'll just highlight a few things. The first page has our scores for the first two years, and both years that we've had needs to match, we've exceeded the state by quite a bit in our average. Um, this, the average scale score statewide was 96 compared to Fillmore Central's average scale score of 111. That's pretty significant, I think. Um, also, out of this group, there were 52 juniors who took the assessments last year. 38 of those juniors met or exceeded. And out of that 52, there were four students that do not attend our school, but we test them nonetheless. And so, when you look at that, that's probably about a six or seven percent difference in score from kids that would have met it to exceed it, would have almost been 80 percent. There is something that's new, or at least new to me, is the governor's report this year. And they identified in most reports of 39 schools in C1, there was one where there were 42 schools that he had listed, but the number of parochial schools that do not report or take state assessments makes up that other percentage. 
So when you see that there were 39 schools in the governor's report related to math, for instance, Fillmore Sandro ranked fifth. If you average the two years together, fifth overall, and they were first among all the SMC schools in Class C1 in math. And you'll see similar things throughout the other NISA reports. So when you see that total that says, you know, 21st out of 39, and then you may go to another one that says 42, in the governor's report, there are three additional schools. I know Centennial was not C1, but in one of his reports, they were listed. So, when you see the difference in numbers, you'll hopefully understand what is being talked about. Um, I've given you in each of the NISAs the average state scale score as well as Fillmore Central scale score. And in each one, Fillmore Central scale score average was higher than the state. The writing, I'll talk about just a touch. The writing, when you look at the assessment in 11 and 12, you'll see a tremendous prop. Score in uh, 07, 08 was 93. In 08, 09 was 100 percent. In 09, 10 it was 98. In 11, 12 it was 63. The reason for that is they implemented a new test assessment. It was to be much more difficult. It was supposed to be more on demand. There were four scores that were given and they broke it down. And it was to be, and from my understanding, it will be implemented now across the board in the other core subject areas. But when you see that, it was a totally different assessment, different means in being assessed. The previous three years, the writing was done over two days. There was a draft and then a final product. This past year was done on a computer and it was a one day assessment. And so, again, the idea here was that preparing kids for college, preparing them for, as they quote, on demand type writing. So, that is, that is the difference in those four years. Sherry? On, on several of these, you say where FC was ranked like 32 out of 42. Yeah. Are you talking about on the scale? I'm talking about the governor's report. The governor's report. But 32 being a good score, not a. In rank. In rank. If you look at the ranking, we were 32nd out of 42 schools that were listed by the governor in his report. Okay. What is ITED testing? That is the Iowa test of educational development. If you go to the ITDS, element... ITDS? Was it ITDS? Yeah. It's and then do they just a different like version. the average of the 9th and 11th graders? Because they're not split on those tests. It's, or am I just reading this? We can we combine. combine. Okay. We combine. And we did that across the board. And then the final one is ACT <clears throat> scores. And there are a few bullets there as well. So far, you look over next month. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer any of them. Or if you have questions now, I'd be happy to do that also. Some of the things that I saw when I look at the at the data. So, uh, 
um, as you look at it and, and reflect, and then if you have any suggestions or ideas or interpretations or other things you'd like to see, let me know. So it's organized much in a similar way. We start with the, the NISA in fourth grade, and Mr. Rose is, is right. That scoring change will be in fourth grade this year as well. It's, we've been holistically scored, and last year we, we were holistically scored, and we did quite quite well, but next year um, it will be analytically scored, so it'll be broken apart a little bit. So, But the format of the test for us should stay the same. In fourth grade, they do not require it to be online. It's still handwritten, and we still have two sessions, so they still have some time to, to reflect and regroup and edit and come back at it. So, um, But the scoring will look different. And so, as you can see by the scores, um, we are um, above the state average consistently and you know we were at a hundred percent proficient last year so so great scores in, in the writing and we look forward to the the new scoring to uh, maybe even better target some of our instruction when we get more specific feedback based on vocabulary ideas and content organization and that kind of more specific feedback when you turn the page you'll see NISA reading and that's the percent that need or exceed the standards and it's, that one's by cohort, so that's looking at the same kids. So in the far right column um, of 2021, 20, believe it or not, that's third graders. So that's the first time that they've taken it, so that's why there's only one score. <coughs> then in fourth grade, we have two years of that and so forth. So that works from third grade over to the eighth grade. So you can see the same group of kids and how they, they're performing. And so when, you know, when you're looking at that kind of data, you're making sure that that now, that's not taking into account um, as neatly as maybe the state will pull out some of those. This is just looking at what was on our reports, you know, so this may be, depending on our mobility rate, you know, but the core of those should be the same kids at each, each grade level. Um, so you want to see that that group of kids is continuing to make, make the progress when you're watching that, that data move for grade level. Um, the next you'll look at by grade level. So, um, again, third to 11th grade, but now this is just in that grade level, so this is different kids each year. So when you're looking at this kind of data, you're just making sure that you don't have a lag in a specific grade level, even though it's different children, that would mean we might need to go back and look at our curriculum alignment or our instructional practices at that grade. So when you're looking at this, that's why you're looking at different kids. Is there, is there a, a lag or a peak that we need to, to further analyze that's something different at a grade level? Um, and then the percent proficient Fillmore Central versus the state is the next one, and that's um, what Mr. Rose was, was talking about. So again, you can see all the grades from 3rd through 11th compared to, um, compared to the, state, the state average. And um, I think Mr. Novell mentioned that last month, and I pulled that note off the bottom, so you can just see the in 4th, 7th, 8th, and 11th grades um, were the grade levels that we exceeded um, in, in read, again, instead of reading. Then the next page is an average scale score. So I gave you a code at the bottom. Individual um, NISA reports for all the content areas are sent home, and that's what parents will be looking at is the scale score to where's the cutoff of if my child met standards or not. So you can see on the key on the bottom, 85 to 134 is meets standards, and then 135 to, to 200 is exceeds standards. So then these are looking at just average. So what's the average scale score of, of all third graders versus, versus the state? So you can see our average score is still much above that cutoff of meeting standard of, at 85 when you look at that all together. And then we move into to math, and it's organized much the same way with the bullets that I pulled out to the bottom. And this is, again, the cohort or graduation year. So moving third grade, which is the first year they take reading and math. We don't have science, um, ESA science at the elementary at this point. Um, I think it might be coming in the future, but <laughs> not at this point. So if you move left to right, you're going up in um, third, fourth, fifth, and, and up. And again, you're looking at the same kids, so to see their progress um, from year to year that they're, that they're growing. Again, grade level, we've only had uh, two years of the math. Um, so not as much data to, to look at. And so, but the same different kids, again, looking for is there consistently one grade level that's, that's drastically different. And then um, math, the average scale score again, same, it's the same cut as 85 is where you meet standards, 85 and 134. So looking at how we score the average. 
Um, our average was higher than the state, for instance. Um, I put that at the bottom for you in 4th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 11th. Our average was higher than the state average. Um, the next page is what we call DIBBLES, which is the Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. That's um, administered as a screener three times a year. Um, in kindergarten, first and second, that's done in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Third and fourth, they have a portion that's done as a whole group, a comprehension portion. Um, but that's a, a basically a, a reading readiness and reading basic reading skill um, screener. And so um, this is the end of the year. So this is pretty stable data. When you're looking at this, you're looking at the entire K-4 population. So you're looking at closer to that 200 students, which are much more stable percentage. You don't have quite as very few, much variable. And, and uh, generally speaking, this chart is kind of how you want to see the data look when you look at the benchmark category, how it's just kind of steadily rising there in a trend in the trend line. So uh, when we watch that, and then the children, just a side note about what we use this this particular one for in conjunction with all the pieces of data is when we have our um, building data team meetings, because we do this three times a year, we talk specifically about a grade level and about the children and then anyone that's in intensive or strategic can start talking about what intervention plans do we need to put in place. So that's kind of how we use, use this data. The next page is CBM math, which we've only done two years now, but it's basically that same kind of three times a year screener, um, but focusing on the academic area of math. And this one is different. The children take this um, as one group on the computer. Um, so this is relatively new to us, but it's beginning that more continual um, dipstick measure of, of where are the kids and, and how are they growing, and then the same levels of concern that they're at in a range of intensive or strategic. And that's a different benchmark at each grade level. It increases. There's a beginning of the year standard. That bar is continually raising as we're, we're going through the year and through the grade levels. Um, the next is a high-frequency word spelling test. And as you can see, there's four years worth of data. That's something that um, is a Fillmore Central Elementary test. We standardize the process so it's administered by the same people, give them the same prompt, but knowing that that's one of the pieces of fluency, which is our um, area target for reading improvement, that's a key piece of that is, is the ability to, um, to read and have quick access to high frequency words. So this is the next level of output. Say the word, it's all standardized process, and then they write and spell. So, um, that data looks pretty stable and we're meeting our standard in that particular little piece of fluency as far as sight words. Um, next you go into ITBS, which that's what many of us remember, the circle test that you filled in, that you took with everybody and they're timed in separate, separate amounts for each area. So you have ITBS uh, math and reading to look at and then this is looking at the percent at or above national average. So when we get our scores you can look at quartiles. Um, so then what quartile they're performing at. And so 50th percentile or above, if you're thinking this is now the normed on the bell curve, you can loosely associate, looking at that, we want to see grade level or above because kind of loosely, if they're right at the average, you're probably, you're talking an average of a grade level, which then you could kind of loosely say that would be um, at a national average of grade level average. So that's why we look at those top, how many are in the top two quartiles, grade level um, or above. And, um, a note for last year's data, which um, we had a, a rise there, it was also renormed. So last year it was a, a, new, a new test that had been, been renormed. So uh, that's just something to note when you see a difference in the data, so just to mentally note that. So it would be great when we have another two or three years with this same normed test. Does that look, does that stay so good with, where the norms for the, the data is there? Um, and then next is total reading. And to answer the question about third and fourth grade, um, we've combined those two when we're looking at this just to have, like I had mentioned with the Dibbles, a more stable number. Because if you're looking at our class sizes that are anywhere for, from, you know, or grade level sizes, um, I guess I'd say, from like 31 to 46, if you're looking then at 31 kids and what would be your percent at benchmark, you know, one or two kids really sway that variable. So the more that the more kids you can get in there, the more stable. So that's why we put two grade levels together to try and um, minimize the impact of that one or two kids score on the overall overall percentage. I'll stabilize that a little bit. Um, so in general, that's the pieces that I put in there. So, um, and I think most of what I said is, is in your bullet points so you can look at it and think about it. And then if you have specific questions or suggestions or other pieces or ways you'd like to look at it, um, 
be happy to do that. I appreciate your, your input on it. Or if there's a different way you'd like to see it that makes it easier to read, too. And we had 90, back, I guess I should have done the opposite order. We had 98% turnout for conferences, so, so it was a good uh, turnout for the elementary. You know, ours looks a little different just because it's the first school years and that, that you know, that looks just different, I think, for parenting. And also, at that level, we can still schedule. So, you know, that's different, too, when you actually get a scheduled time that you're expected to be there. I think that changes it a little bit, too, but, but that's a nice, a nice turnout. And then everyone that doesn't come is contacted at least once personally. Okay. Any questions? Okay, uh, just a couple things to add, uh, touch upon the board report itself. Uh, I just would like to add that a fifth grader Alyssa Gillen and a sixth grader Ryan Popper have both been named to the Sing Along Nebraska group. Uh, so they, Mrs. Uh, Miss Jamison was very excited about that. They put in a lot of time and practice and they were part of a, uh, that group. So I would like to congratulate them. As well as uh, I believe Stan Tatro has now cleaned up uh, around the middle school and got most of the uh, uh, the bleachers, the football area, pretty much cleaned up and things that way. So if you're up in that uh, that area, stop by and look at it. It does look a little bit different, and uh, I think it adds to the appearance of the building and I, you know, and the campus itself makes it look better. So I appreciate uh, Stan's work with it, and he's easy to work with that sort of thing. So in terms of my data report, uh, as what I did in the front of the report, I went ahead and put some bulleted items that would relate to each test. Uh, group as you go through the book itself and I'll, I'll touch upon some of those bulleted items if you have questions please ask uh, I'll echo with what Michelle said if there's a better way for me to put it together for you the next time let me know or if you have questions as you look through the book uh, please go ahead and contact me and I, and I would be more than happy to, to help explain some things uh, along that line uh, the first uh, part of data that I put together was for our Stanford reading uh, comprehensive test which is given to a five through eight uh, grade students. Important for this test for us, it is one of the uh, three instruments that we use when it comes for reading intervention and uh, putting together, uh, you know, in terms of helping with, with students with reading, uh, maybe if they have some deficiencies. But some highlights of that, 76% uh, or higher of grades five through eight were at benchmark, which is grade level for the past four years. So our reading in that sense. And also 43% have been scored at reading at post high school level. So uh, I think that's uh, uh, important to look at. Uh, in terms of the NISA uh, test I uh, put together for the writing test, uh, I'd like to echo what Mr. Rose said as well. I think if you look at that graph itself, it does can look very alarming, uh, simply because we go from 91% down to 54%. Uh, I know I'm looking back at Mr. Klein's notes that uh, he, he, he presented a, a, a nice report for you in, this, in June that I, I think uh, you know, sh uh, express some concerns that he would have in terms of the, the test itself. As Mr. Rose said, it was administered uh, differently in which it was totally done online, or excuse me, word processed. Okay? It was also done uh, in one day, uh, so those elements were different. And then it was scored, as Mrs. Uh, Ms. Ray uh, Mrs. Rayburn said, uh, analytically, which also had an impact on the score. Uh, as I noted, Mrs. Stingle and, my, and I myself have been in communication about uh, some ways that we can look at better preparing our students as they prepare for the NISA test, the NISA writing that will be coming up in January. So we again had a conversation about it today and she's uh, you know, very in tune to what she would like to see in terms of uh, done earlier for her students to be successful. So that's the NISA writing score. So it is does look alarming, but I think uh, with some corrections, hopefully the, the scores will be better. Uh, in terms of the NISA reading, uh, that uh, score that for you, uh, it's just a couple uh, items that I said of the past three years, uh, higher, higher percentage of our 7th and 8th grade students have met or exceeded this uh, standard than the state, and that's been consistent for the past three years. Uh, the 5th and 6th grade scores, uh, they were below uh, the state average this past year. Uh, it is part of the school improvements goal to uh, improve uh, reading comprehension for all fit, all uh, school, uh, students throughout the district. So that is part of our uh, school improvement goal and, and we've been working diligently on that this first semester, uh, once a month on our early outs that the board has agreed to allow the, the teachers to have for work days. So uh, that's just some uh, 
earmarks there for you. Uh, the math, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on, just highlighted uh, one of the grades 6 through 8 has scored at a higher percentage of proficiency than the state in each year of, of the testing. So, uh, you know, we've done uh, well in that regards as well. Uh, the Explore test, uh, I, I gave you a, the four tests combined together of the English, math, reading, and science, then also broke down per test for you to look at if you'd like to look at that individually. Uh, the Explore test is part of the ACT battery of tests. It's to uh, gauge the college bound readiness of an eighth grader. Uh, just some things for you, our eighth graders scored near or at the 50th percentile uh, in each of the years. So it, it does indicate that the, in terms of their college uh, readiness benchmark that they've been able to meet for the Explore test. Uh, the ITBS test then is an, are some other data that I shared with you. Uh, just 85% uh, of our 6th and 8th graders of combined scores in math were at above the national average uh, for you to look at. Uh, and then, you know, the other test scores as well. Uh, the final sheet that I gave you is, is really not in terms of a, of a, re, of a test that we give, but uh, I, I think in, in looking at the, uh, our annual down list summary data, uh, what, the reason I gave you this is, is I, I do want to put in a, I, I think a continual, uh, I guess, uh, uh, applause to our teachers. We do have, a, in the middle school, we have a, a lab class, and, and some people want to call it a study hall. We don't call it a lab because uh, I believe the difference is that our core teachers are available at that particular time of the day in which our 7th and 8th grade students can then go and work individually with a teacher that they may be getting behind in an individual class, uh, maybe not understand assignments, uh, maybe have the opportunity to retake assignments or tests. And I do think that that has a direct impact upon their, our students and those that are on the down list and those that are, are failing classes because those core teachers are there and available for them and uh, at the time that's convenient for the student sometimes. So uh, that's all I have for you. If you have any questions, uh, let me know or you know, email me or let Mr. Norvell know and, and I would be happy to get a hold of you. Yeah, all of this data it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, but our steering committee will look at it, and uh, also our school improvement committee, which Mr. Atkinson and Ms. Stengel lead the school improvement committee, and there's board representation on our school improvement committee, and they'll review, review that data, make sure that we're still on our, our basic goal. Our goal is to improve reading throughout the district, K-12, and you know, does our goal need to change and move to math or whatever? They they take a look at that, those areas, and decide if we're if we're on track. Remember that a one-year set of data is just a snapshot. We really need more than one year to make good decisions. But uh, you know, our our data is is good, and uh, we've done well uh, overall in the NISA area. Probably didn't do as well as we did a year ago, but uh, we've been pretty consistent over time. But it's not, it's not like we spend five minutes at a board meeting or 10 or 15 and never look at it again. We have two sets of groups of people that take a real good look at this and make sure that we're, we're, we're on track. Um, representatives from Clark Anderson are here and they'll be doing a little PowerPoint when we get down the, the agenda here. So, uh, and our science teachers are also here. They've been working with them on this uh, particular project. The State of the Schools report does come out on November 20th. It will be available on the Department of Ed website, and it will include, I would, I would believe, a lot of this data. Uh, annual report. We have an annual report. I thought I sent it to you electronically. I know there's at least a copy in your stuff, and then it's also online. It's also on our website. Um, just a reminder from our, a year ago we had the Civil Rights Review. And they said that we needed to either provide a ramp or a lift for handicapped students to our shop area, and they gave us two years to complete that. And, and uh, Clark Anderson will talk a little bit about that also uh, tonight. Um, we are looking at offering a breakfast program in our respective buildings next year, and we're still working out some details on that, so we're going to keep you posted. 
One other item is that right now we're, what we're planning on doing was we're planning on playing our junior varsity boys basketball games at Fairmont rather than at the downtown gym. There's six games and the reason being is just we're, we have handicapped grandparents that want to attend and uh, Fairmont is more handicap accessible. We put all new lights in up there, the seating is better. Certainly the restrooms are better and cleaner. The, the, only, the only big issue is getting kids up there. We don't want all of our kids driving up there that are participating. And so Bob's arranged that we'll have a bus. Either he'll bus the, the, the boys up there, and then one of our bus drivers, after they finish their route, will stop and wait and then bus the kids back down. That's the only issue that we really have. It's a much better facility. It is eight miles away, but we think it's it's probably worth it for people. I would certainly listen to your input on it, and we plan on doing it. We haven't made the final decision yet, but that's that's the plan, and the coaches are all in favor, and the, the kids like it. Mr. Malone, Mr. Rose, we've talked about it for about a month, and we just think it's it's the right thing to do. It's just a much better much better facility. The issue was we just didn't want all of our JV boys and then the coaches make the varsity boys watch the JV game. We just didn't want all those vehicles going up there and uh, so there there will be some cost to the district for a, for a bus and a driver but I think it's for six ball games that's pretty minimal to be honest with you and I just think it's a, a much better place to have a, a junior varsity game. It's always just the boys. We play our JVs at the same time. The girls JV is always here the boys JVs at the same time and so instead of using the downtown gym we'd like to use the Fairmont gym. So. The only concern I would have Mark would be the bleachers on the south side there they crunch down and it is a danger spot for people coming up and down that steps. Um, We'll look into that. And I wish that's Steve's marking that down. Right that's now. the only. I think you know, Steve. I think you know exactly what you want to talk about. Where it's at. It's no, I really don't. Okay. But I'll, we will find it. Oh, uh, I guarantee you, it's there. If I, it's, okay, it's I will. Ability. On the south side, we'll get it. Yeah. There. I'll speak. It's to like that long. first section. Okay. You bet. I think that's great, and I can't believe that they're running the junior high games though. There was no scheduling conflicts. No scheduling conflicts. I mean, the junior high practices would be disrupted. Two of the games are Saturdays. Two of the six dates are Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah. So the other four are during the week, but there was no junior high conflicts other than they would they'd have to shorten up their practice schedule. Yeah, I guess one thing I would suggest. <clears throat> I know when I went out of town games before, somehow let the other towns know. No. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. Yeah. We'll, we'll you you drive into town, they say, oh no, it's eight, eight miles that way. It's like, oh, yeah. it's one mile. And I, so. we're, we're not going to take any gate up there. I don't think we did at the downtown gym either. I think the only gate we take is here because you know, it's just too hard to try to, to try to manage. So, Anybody else? That's a good idea. Sure. Not about that. This thing, does this, how does this go out? Who gets a copy of this? Well, it's it's on the website, so anybody could have a copy. Okay. And then it's, I mean, anybody that wants a copy, I'll, I'll mail them a copy. Okay, uh, so it doesn't go out with the newsletter. In the, in the newsletter, we just told them that it's available on the on the website. We don't we don't mail out newsletters though, unless people have asked for a newsletter. I think we only mail about 50 newsletters out. We just make them available at the grocery store, maybe in the bank, and then we put it on the website. Okay. But, we have a list that anybody that calls in and wants a newsletter, we keep a list and we mail them out. We used to mail, you know, seven, eight hundred, but now we mail about fifty. And then the school improvement committee, who's on that? Steve. Uh, the in terms of the, the whole of district. The board. Of the well, board. Uh, Jan is on it, and Mark. And then I think that's the only two board members. Then we have community members, and I'm probably going to. Say the wrong names, but help me out. Steve Shermeyer at one time. Steve Shermeyer was, and Debbie. Jenny Horty. Yeah. Debbie Yates. Debbie Yates. And I'm going to leave someone out. And then staff wise, then each district, each building is represented. Uh, the elementary would be Heidi Farmer. Help me out, Michelle. Jenny Eichelberger. Okay. 
and Michelle, okay? and then the middle school is Jenny Stingle, myself, Mark Madison. The high school is Aaron, uh, Adam Burhey, Mitch Lockhart, and uh, Jenny Stingle kind of was, yeah, and Casey had, and, Casey, yeah. yeah. I can get you the names here. I, I apologize. I should. I don't know them all. It was just a surprise to me. I didn't know it existed. Yeah. Okay. Mark's not doing a very good report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've always had a school improvement committee here. Since, I mean, probably, well, we didn't have when I first came. We just had the steering committee. I think Mr. Klein kind of got it started, the school improvement. We kind of broke it off. The steering committee did all of those things, and we broke off and started a school improvement committee probably six years ago, though. It's probably been at least six years old. It was a group that rewrote the mission. Mission statement. Mm -hmm. That was like, the big thing. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Every five years, we're responsible to do a yeah. It's, it's the state of Nebraska comes and does a review right. every five years. So you're on a five-year cycle. Although they tell you now the cycle is continuous, they just review you every five years. Right. But the next year is our review. Correct. Steve. Outside of review. Yeah. So we have an external, external team, will come team. In next spring. We'll have an administrator and. Probably a, uh, like an English and math science teacher from other districts come in and, and do a review of our school. You can spend a day or two with us. So. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I'm done. Okay, then before we go to the action, can we move back up to the public comment real quick, Mike? Right? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to congratulate all the folks that did uh, go for re election and re elected, but we also have a, a teacher new member out there. Thank you, DJ. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we need a motion for the minutes of the October 8th meeting. So moved. Second. It's moved by Shelkoff and Sickness by Donovan. Does the board approve the minutes of the October 8th Framework Board Education meeting? Discussion? Roll call. Shelkoff. Yes. Donovan? Yes. Lightwing? Yes. Noelle? Yes. Men, yes. Oshner? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Dummer? Yes. Need a motion for the financial reports? <coughs> Moved by Dave and seconded by Mark that the board approve the financial reports as presented. Discussion? Roll call. Oshner? Yes. Lightwing? Yes. Maloli? Yes. Nanya Shelkoff? Yes. Donovan? Yes. Klein Schmidt? Yes. Demeyer? Yes. We need a motion for the general fund claims? I will move. Moved by Jim and seconded by Dana that the board approved the general fund claims in the amount of $216,600.68. Discussion? I want to go over about three of them with you. <coughs> There's one that says uh, about the middle of the first page, the band uniforms, fruit off uniforms, and the total cost of band uniforms was $45,000. We're, we're paying $35,000 at this time, and uh, I think the band booster club is going to try to see if they can pay that remaining, at least that was the original deal, and if they can't, we may have to pay a little more, but I think that's that's what our attempt is there. A little further down under there is a Glenwood Telecommunications 20,000, that's for the phone system at the elementary. It's all three of our buildings now have the same phone system, and for our safety and security plan, every room now can dial out and dial the office, so it's the first time we've had that ever. And, which is a good thing. And then a little further down, Kelch Plumbing and Heating, that's a large bill, 41000 That was really 36000 of that this summer. Lightning had struck and we had a power outage and burn out one of our uh, condensers, compressors for the chiller. And we got insurance paid for 37000 in September and we put that in our general fund miscellaneous receipts so we're paying it out of general fund 
So it's something that, you know, we didn't necessarily plan in the budget. We were hoping to finish that all and get that all done prior to September 1 on last year's budget, but we didn't. So that's that. So we did get that amount of money in, into, or 37000 into uh, uh, general fund receipts. So just to let you know. And Mark, I would emailed you about that question you had today to get the answer to that. Uh, Mark had a question on RNA transport, and that is for the young man that we transport to Epworth, I think. Is that right, Steve? Yes, uh, we, yeah, we have two of them. Yeah. yeah, riding. We ride, a, we pay for a couple of our behavioral students to go to Epworth Village for mm -hmm. both school and treatment. So, do it's RNA transport where they are? I'm not sure I know where they're out of. Pardon me? Do we know where they're out of? Are they transported? Are they out York. It, it's out of York. Right? I believe they go to Ebring Inn. It, but the number I call is a 362, which I think is York. So. Okay. Okay. Roll call? Donovan? Yes. Shellcock? Yes. Nine, yes. Oshner? Yes. Frank Schmidt? Yes. Right line? Yes. Mulally? Yes. Demo? Yes. Uh, 0.5 FTE, FTE art position. I'll second. <coughs> Moved by Jan and seconded by Jim that the board approved the addition of a 0.5 FTE art position for the 2013-2014 school year. Discussion? Roll call. Shellcock? Yes. Donovan? Yes. Oshner? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Lightwing? Yes. Maloli? Yes. Nine, yes. Dummer? Yes. Point five FTE social studies position for the 2014-2015 school year. Moved by Dave and seconded by Mark, the board approved the addition of a 0.5 FTE social studies position for the 2014-2015 school year. Discussion? I, I guess I had a question. <clears throat> That's a whole year or year and a half late. We want to wait. I think everything's going to be fine when we talk about it the last meeting and you know, maybe wait until we have a new board after January 1. I don't think it's going to make any difference. But you know, since that's one year away, is a thought I had. Further discussion? Does that affect your planning at all, Mr. Um. Uh, not, not, not really. I, I can make whatever adjustments necessary. I just. We had talked about doing it. It's two of the things we wanted to do. And I think we talked about doing it, so we'll just do it at the same time. At least we know we can prepare and have it done, but I'll do whatever, whatever the board wants to do. It's going to have to be voted on tonight because it's been a motion and a second. But. We could uh, all change our mind. Well, I guess that's, that's what I'm saying is, you know, we're, I think we're all agreeing, but we're planning on doing that. It's nice to have the intent. It's nice that people know the intent, especially for people on our staff. Mm -hmm. and I, I, mean, I agree that everybody make up on it. It gives the staff some direction. Good point, actually. But Randy's right. It's, it's a long ways away. You know, I mean, <laughs> It's yeah, over I know we talked about it, I think everybody thinks it's, it's over a year and a half away. Yeah. I understand. Any further discussion? Roll call? Asha? Yes. Lightline? Yes. Shellcock? Yes. Donovan? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Maloli? Yes. None, yes. Dummer? Yes. High school parking lot light proposal. 
need a motion? No. Moved by Jim and seconded by Mark that the board approve the high school parking lot light proposal from the MPPD as presented. You should have had a picture in there. It's just amazing it <laughs> cover that much area. <laughs> I yeah, evidently it's gonna be bright. Like they said, they'll do it. And then if we need adjustments or want to change something, we can change it later. We kind of have to see what it looks like. But they, they, they told me they use them at different places in New York and whatever in their grades. Can you explain a little bit? I mean, we know this. You should send an email to us. Sure, sure. Um, basically, NPPD, rather than they come in and we have to buy poles and electrician and install. They offer a service where they will put up, in this particular case, two poles. One is already an existing pole, excuse me, on the what is that, southwest corner there. That's an existing pole. They would put up a new pole right by. I'm guessing those are detasseling buses from the summer park there. <laughs> 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 it's, it's a you know, GPS during the summer. But they put up that new pole mount two of the uh, floodlights there, it would be almost straight across over here. And uh, those three floodlights they feel like will light up our whole parking lot. The cost to the district I believe was around $83 a month and you basically you just rent that forever and then they, they're responsible for the maintenance. Any new lights MPPD takes care of, uh, I suppose, a storm. I think we're paying for the wire the first time and the pole for, or the wire the first time, but after that it's, we're renting it or it's part of the rent agreement, whatever. So they looked at different things, but they think this will work. If this doesn't work, they'll come back and they'll make adjustments. Then we're also talking with the city about furnishing lights down the street. It is it is a public street, and we've provided the light for that street since the school was built in 1975. So we're working with Kyle and the city on that the city and MPPD would also do that work and of course they would bill the city by month for that light instead of billing the school which I think seems reasonable I'm not sure that city council will see it as reasonable but I'm hoping they do I think they will but all of I didn't I didn't know all the lights were into our breaker box but Bob said they're all I mean he can hit the breaker and they all go off so they're all into our breaker box and the, the lights we have now, I, I think they were attractive probably in 1975, but as Jim would tell you, that they're just, it's, they're just impossible to keep up. The wind, the wind is terrible on, the bases are just eroded after so many years, so they wobble back and forth, which burns out the light. They're also targets for BB guns and rocks. And it works, you know, we can't get parts. Yeah, we can. I think when we did get the bulbs, they were running around $50 a bulb, too, to replace the, the lights. So it was, I mean, it was it was pretty expensive. And we have, I don't know, I haven't counted them, but we have way more than what we need. They were put in to be attractive and uh, you know, just not just not very feasible. And, it, and people get upset when you have lights burn out. I mean, they do. They come by and they're out. Well. It's just a never-ending, they're always going to be out. If the wind blows more than 20 miles an hour, we'll have lights out. That's just the way it is. So, you know, it's just, it's impossible to change them all all the time. And, and, so if we're looking for a better solution, I think this would be, this would be great. And we would, we would take, do the work of removing the existing poles, and uh, we would do that. So. One hint something that's not on or anything, but I know you talked about one time, what about you with the football? About replacing that. Yeah. I'm sitting there thinking these going, oh, what goodness. We got, I actually, this week, Thursday, maybe Wednesday, I have a guy from Ardent Lighting in Iowa that does football fields. He's going to stop by and take a look at what we have. So. We will like, start on this right away. After this board meeting tonight, I'll call them tomorrow. They said they'd have it up by Thanksgiving, for us, which would be before basketball season. The city, I don't know how long that'll take. I'm guessing they're going to at least need a couple meetings to talk about it. I mean, that would be my guess. 
uh, NPPD has contacted the city, and so we're just kind of waiting for them to get back. I forgot it was a holiday today. I tried to call Kyle, couldn't figure out why I couldn't get home. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, I think it's a, I think it's a great proposal. And then for our for our back and for out that side, we're going to basically take the same kind of lights and just hire an electrician and mount them on the building, rather than pay rent for a pole. So. And that'd be our expense, the district. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing now for the whole campus. We'll. Right. right. There's no rent. Okay. Well, the, we have to pay rent to NPPD for those floodlights. We are paying rent right now. No, we're not paying anything that's right now. Yeah. This is a new yeah. subject. This would be new. That's what I this would be new. But, but we're also providing light for the street, which we have for 37 years, and I'm hoping that we can get out of that. So I'm guessing maybe there will be some comparative cost savings there. So, so then that, that our rent covers electricity, too? To run the lights. They probably hooked into our breaker box. I don't know. Yeah. I doubt it. It probably still gets needed. So we're paying rent right on the pole. And we're paying basically. Well, paying see, that, a that wouldn't, contract they wouldn't have a way to, to keep track of that, though. That's true. That, yeah. so so we're paying, we're basically saying a service contract. We're, we're paying $83 a month. Maintenance Because yeah. it wouldn't be hooked up to our meter in any way. In way, I wouldn't think it should be on the city's bill. Right. Yeah. So I would guess. Sure. So. And Mark? Would you propose doing those right away? Um, are they the new LED lights? They are. They won't use much electricity anyhow. Yeah, I don't. I got a, a picture with what they are, and I don't think I brought it with me, Bill. Sorry, but I can I can I can find out for you. It might say they're 400 watt HPS floodlights. If that means high anything. pressure sodium. High pressure sodium. Okay. <laughs> I'm guessing that's what that stands for. Yeah. yeah. They're going to be. They're going to have the yellow orange tint to them then. Yeah, Most sodium lights do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't know. They said if we didn't like them, they'll make adjustments, so they're going to okay. give it a try. But it's what they use on other parking lots, so I'm guessing it's it's going to be good. Who's putting them on the back side? Uh, we'll have we'll hire an electrician to do it. We haven't got to that yet. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call. <clears throat> Donovan? Yes. Lightwing? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Malili? Yes. Then yes, Oshner? Yes. Shelkoff? Yes. And Demeyer? Yes. Uh, high school softball cooperative arena with Hexler Milligan. Is motion? Second. by Mark and seconded by Randy that the board approved cooperation with Exeter Milligan Public Schools for a senior high girls softball. That would be a two-year agreement. That would be for the fall of 2013 and for the fall of 2014. Should, that should be instead of cooperation, it would be a cooperative. NSA cooperative. Okay. Discussion? Lightline? Yes. Kleinschmidt? Yes. Malili? Yes. And then yes, Oshner? Yes. Shelkoff? Yes. Donovan? Yes. And Demery? Yes. And then we move into the discussion items. Uh, the first one is review the science room, remodel, and estimated costs. Tim and TJ, I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, Mitch Lockhart and Dave Segerman, our science teachers, are also here who work with them. I think they got a little PowerPoint, so Sherry and I and David Dennis will probably have to adjust our seats a little bit here. There is some paperwork there too, but I had a great big piece of paper. It says Clark Anderson Parker's on it. That's right. That's all right. As we get always get a little bit 
free to move up closer too if you want to, if you want to. Can't see from there. Well, Mark asked us to come out and look at science room. So we had two meetings with Mr. Rose and the science staff. Um, kind of a preliminary meeting, and then we did a follow-up meeting. Uh, the images that you have in your packet are basically the same as what we have here. We just put a little bit of color on some of these images. Um, basically, the it must just be my eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you're not familiar with the room right now, there's a chemistry room, a room in the middle here that is used for a computer room, a prep area in the back, and then biology is on just the head for physical science, whatever. So uh, our charge was to take out the middle reel and put a work reel in between, increasing the size of both rooms as much as we can. Um, adding windows, new casework, um, a fume hood, chemical storage cabinets, new sinks, new islands, um, space for both laboratory and teaching space in chemistry. I guess we can kind of walk around the room, but chemistry basically has um, a shower, eye wash station, goggle sanitizing cabinet, um, marker boards, uh, full height wardrobe, storage units, an ADA station, a sink for washware, um, clean up, six four-person islands, uh, teacher work area, a few hood, general casework, um, marker boards and smart boards across the front of the room, the center work area has chemical storage cabinets, storage cabinets, um, counter for sinks both sides of the room, uh, <coughs> space for refrigerator, space for gas manifold, bottle storage, marker board on the end of the wall. Um, we're showing three four-foot windows in the exterior walls of both classrooms right now. Um, biology room goes from five sink areas to six sink areas. Again, new casework, full height, uh, laboratory storage cabinets, a teacher island, teacher workspace in the corner of the room. Uh, because the size of the rooms get bigger, we have to add a second door whenever you go over a thousand square foot in the classroom and you need to have two, two redress points. So probably need to pocket this door in so this it doesn't interfere with this uh, corridor situation. Um, chemistry room, just some 3D imagery. We put a little bit of color on. We haven't modeled them fully, but it gives you a feel for this is the general purpose uh, classroom science lab tables, where marker boards are. Glass front, storage cabinets. So that actually moved it over here. Again, just some additional views. The um, lab islands that will all have cup sinks, air manifolds, gas manifolds, hot and cold water. Just a general view of the biology room. Again. Um, like eight foot separate work islands separated by 
full height storage cabinets, marker boards, tack boards. Be views each direction in the work area in the middle. So over overhead views, northwest, southwest, and northeast and southwest. I guess. Did you read that? <laughs> <clears throat> about as small as the printout that we read about. Hopefully, you have your reading glasses with you. Uh, Still. Schematic design, original or budget, and I think we're at about 477,000 uh, estimated cost at this point. As we get further into design, we'll refine that number. The more we know about things, we're making assumptions at this point on several things, but try to itemize out as much information as we can. Well, one of the things that is having an impact on that cost is the state fire marshal says that if you do this project, the room is going to have to be sprinkled, uh, which you don't have any part of your school sprinkled right now, so we have to uh, bring in a new fire sprinkler service, if you will, and water service. Um, they will likely require you to have a plan for sprinkling the rest of the building at that point. Um, maybe a five-year plan where you do something every year, or however you want to do it. Uh, it's probably not a bad idea in any event, but we, we do have the cost of bringing in the water service and then which would be in the east end of the building and bringing sprinkler system piping around to the science room and, and sprinkling those rooms, you know, the shop area and those spaces, kind of as we go. So that then in years to come you could, you could kind of add on to that in however big an increment you'd like to. Um, that's what we've been included. That's what the State Fire Marshal's Office in Lincoln tells us. They do. We will need so to talk to Pat Merritt, the local fire marshal. We need to. That's, that was my question was with Pat. I mean, yeah. I've seen where it's like you do one, you have to do the whole building. Yeah. And not in five years, but you got to be done. It, it depends on the local marshal. It really does. When when we did West Holt, they, they let them write up a, a five-year plan, and it was phased over three summers. We do one building, do we have to do them all then? No, I just know. where we put the nail in. You put the nail in one building, then that's yeah. how you get. That's Usually when it's a major renovation, they'll, they'll make you make the step, or at least make progress towards the step. We, uh, I can't say that, unless you remember one, a district where they haven't allowed the, the plan for, for a school district, you know, the, the five-year plan or, or whatever sort of plan you come up with. That said, the state fire marshal's office is kind of interesting because each local fire marshal is his own authority, so he can uh, sort of make up his rules the way the way he wants to. So that'll be important to figure out. Here. That's what I wonder when you said about Pat. You know, it's like this. Yeah. The question I got is, you'll come in, just an example, gentlemen, before yeah, we got that out of the girls' facility. It was over a half a million dollars for that small administration right. building in school park. But we'll get a hold of him here within the next few days. And that was I had confirmed. It's usually best to get the marshal in the building, but some people don't like getting code officials in the building. <laughs> 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 then they start looking around. So, um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's usually better to jump on it and get their interpretation in the building so that if he sees that you do have area separation doors or something, he, he may make you phase, or he may allow you to phase a lot more than if it's an open floor plan building. Most of your corridor walls are all structural bearing walls, so there is fire separation in your building. And you have separation doors there and there and down on the end of the hallway down here. So it is phased out there. So just for the science rooms that put me in the system, that's the twenty seven. Um is this kind of what you want us to Um yeah, we looked up um 
uh, Nebraska or National Science Teachers Association mandates for science classrooms, and there's about 30 or so that we thought this project would fit what we currently aren't in compliance with. And so for um, square footage, for having um, ventilation purposes, hot and cold water, ADA accessible, all those type of things that are safety concerns and would be uh, what you think a modern classroom would have, this project fits, which is what we wanted to see. So we basically kind of went, well, what would you like to have? And that's kind of what they worked with us and said, you tell us, we'll put it down. And we kind of went from there and then made what, what was possible, what's not possible, and changed it that way. And that's how we came across it. So. And Mitch's original sketch showed stuff fitting in a lot better than our <laughs> <laughs> could add on to the building that this will handle your class size yeah they they made it um, for about 24 which is a pretty normal classroom size for us and so square footage wise that's about perfect for everything that we're trying to do and fits the mandates and fits all the guidelines and regulations that they suggested per student per square footage so and the, the same guidelines that she's talking about really recommend that you don't go over about 24 students in a science classroom mm -hmm. Um, I guess the other part of the puzzle we've been looking at is the IT classroom. Uh, Mark mentioned the lift. We looked at improving the exhaust in the room. But I think that was the first piece IT of lift the, is a, there's a colored pamphlet that goes over the lift and then there's the small that they, we handed out just a small piece like this that has the cost so I think it would be yeah, the first piece was improving the magnifying glass uh, mechanical <laughs> mechanical upgrade to exhaust uh, we looked at replacing the two exhaust bands that are there and just reconnecting them to your existing hood systems um, comes out about seventeen thousand dollars and then we looked at two options for ADA accessibility to that lower level. One is to add a mechanical lift like the cut sheet, which would basically entail um, removing the stairs that are there, extending that platform out about, I think, six feet is what I assumed. And then installing the mechanical lift. Um, I got this cut sheet from O'Keefe Elevators out of Omaha that it's a, I think it's a Tyson Crip elevator or man lift, fairly standard unit. The other option was, that we looked at was to add a ramp, which would basically take up 10 foot along the entire west side of the room. So you lose about 10 foot in your science room. For 40 inches of rise, we need 40 foot of ramp plus a landing at 30 foot. So it, it, it would take up the entire um, west wall. You'd have to ramp down, do a switch back, and ramp back down another 10 feet. So there's a, a hood. Well, there are two different hoods in that corner of the room that would basically get pushed out more into the middle of the classroom. So you'd lose about. 10 foot out of your science rooms, plus it's about $20,000 more expensive to do that, the way we analyzed it. We looked at these costs if we did them with the science room renovation. Yeah, they, basically these are, the, these last three items if we were to include them in a in a bid package where we did we did drawings for the science room renovation, we would simply add some drawings to specifications for these items. Um, you can see uh, in the cost estimates right above the total on each, it says TSAP AE Basic Services. That's our fee for uh, providing bidding documents helping you bid the project and then providing construct some construction oversight. Uh, the, the only other cost that there would be for Clark Ederson would be what, what are called 
reimbursable expenses, and they'd be standard reimbursable expenses, which basically means uh, cost for printing drawings, uh, depending on how we do that so that contractors can bid it, um, and, and our travel expenses are about all that would entail for a project like this. Um, so that said, these, these last few, if you wanted us to include those in the bid package, that's great, and we can do that. If you didn't, um, you just wanted to go out and hire somebody to do this type of work separately, you could, you could do that, and obviously we wouldn't charge you anything for that. Um, in talking schedule, uh, the desire that, that was given to us was to have maybe have this work done next summer. Uh, we think that in order to do that in, in an efficient way, you'd really want to uh, approve a contract with a contractor, probably your March uh, board meeting. That would give them time to mobilize and get the, the long lead item here is going to be the casework at the labs, which will be about 12 weeks. So if, uh, if you did that, they would have that casework here by the 1st of July. That's also you know, one of the last things to go in. So, um, so that works out pretty well. It give them time to mobilize and get started on construction. Uh, when school is out, work through the summer, and we think that should be adequate time for a contractor to, to get construction complete. Backing out from there, we would need to send drawings out to bid in, in about mid-February in order to get the bids back in, in mid-March. Backing up from there, the, the first step would be, uh, provided you want us to provide a design for you and, and get it out to bid, is approval of, of our fee uh, so that we can, we can go and create construction documents for bid. And we, you know, that could happen in night or in your December meeting. I mean, if we had a couple months, we could, we could, we could do this. So uh, that's kind of where we're at, if that makes, if that makes sense. Questions? So the only, the only thing that would change if, we, if the board decided maybe later this spring that they wanted to do this, the only thing that would change would be if we wanted to do it for the following summer, not this coming summer, right. would be possibly some of the fees or the, the, the bids may change over yeah. around this time. But, yeah, I think we'd want to, I think we'd want to reevaluate that at that time. Um, it, I, I wouldn't anticipate at this time that there's going to be some huge uh, cost change. It's not a big enough project. You know, a lot of the thing fluctuation that we see in construction costs is in can be in steel. Uh, several years ago, steel was going through the roof, and and you, well, if you didn't nail it now, you had no idea what the price is going to be six months from now. Um, copper is kind of that way, and you will have copper in here, you know, wiring and pipe and stuff like that. But it's probably not enough to make a huge difference. We just want to review that cost. Later on, there's always going to be some escalation. The longer you wait, the more you <coughs> Can you talk about what we talked about the other day, the kind of payment structure? I mean, when we're doing the projects, how the payments work? Sure. Um, I guess the, the first payments that you would incur uh, would come from us, um, and, but that's a smaller portion of the, of the work that wouldn't be terribly significant. Uh, if, if you approve bids in, in March, uh, the way the project is, is paid out to a contractor is they submit a pay application, and on that pay application they ask for payment of stored materials plus work that they've, they've completed. So Here's your landfill curve. It's, you, you hit a four or five month job like this, you'll have 50% of the work or 60% of the work three months in. When they have to pay a supplier for all the casework or buy the equipment, you, you, you pay as you, you pay as you go. In other words, it's not like a you know home remodel where you might pay 50% up front and, or whatever, 25% you know, up front, 50% halfway through, and 25% at the end. It's it's a pay as you go. Money is held back. Um, 
retainage is held from the contractor so that even with that last pay application, uh, you still are holding some of their money so that that's the way we ensure that things get buttoned up. Um, we usually retain 50% of the con or 10 percent of the contract through 50 percent and then five percent until the very end so you have to get substantial completion before they get all of their money so you would be paying all through the summer and then even in the fall but it be spread out as they're doing work. you guys would oversee the, the punch list at the end there we'd oversee the punch list and we'd oversee the we're, we're uh, responsible for overseeing those pay applications and telling you generally yes that's that, that that's okay we can't count every uh, you know every, every screw or anything like that but, but we're responsible for looking at those and making sure that their numbers add up and that that is the state of construction that they're they're in Sam and I have even gone out when we were in a bad mood one time and verified that the contractor had a wire in his warehouse that was for the job before we pay. So. We asked for $200,000 for wire that wasn't on the job site, so we went to his warehouse and there was there. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and we, were. We, we have contract administrators that will attend the monthly meetings or bi-weekly meetings, whatever we determine. That still is. And we oversee the construction and make sure it's going in the right path. And then we also review submittals, what happens when they We'll specify a product, um, for example, a lab bench, and the contractor then, before they go out and purchase that lab bench, will send through a, a shop drawing at the lab bench, which we review to make sure that that's, that's what we want, approve that, and then they can go out and order. Those are the things, those are the big things that we do during construction, and, and obviously, obviously. So if it was going to happen this, if we approved it, when it's going to happen this summer, next month's the last month. We need to probably do it. Our approval, well, our at least board approval. Uh, January at the very latest. Janu or? January, you'd really be pushing us. Um, that would be just, yeah, just, that'd just be really hard. Hard. Yeah, that, that, that would be that would be tough. I, I think in January, it may be tough to get bids back for your March. Might get this back to your April meeting, and what that might mean is that while there's a potential of getting it done by the end of summer, I think there's potential that it could slip into the first few weeks of the, of the fall semester. So you want to make sure you don't give contractors too little time. That no, I understand. They I just wonder the time. Let me get architecturally, we're probably 50 percent done with design, but we haven't. Right. Other than schematically looked at it, mechanically looked at it. So if we, as an example, we're going to go to next month, this is what we're, these are the numbers we're working with. These are, this is a, this is a cost estimate. So mm -hmm. you're working in general in those numbers. I guess what I would maybe suggest is that next month, uh, if you want to vote on something, you vote on whether to retain us to create fitting documents. Um, and then you could vote so in February. Right, you would vote in February. Approve it. Approve it. This. So exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then we could go ahead. the way that works for, for our fee also, if, say, you approve us to do bidding documents and we get through the drawings and you decide you're not even going to send it out to bid, something changed drastically and you don't even want to do that. Well, uh, we would be 75% of the way through our work, so it would be 75% of our fee. Charge another 5% for taking it through bidding. So if you get to that point and you decide you don't want to do it, you're 80% of the way through us, we would charge you the rest of the way. 20% of our work is on That's pretty, that's standard for our So then you make recommendations on the contractors that apply, and then we take those yeah, you you can't you the way we anticipate we do this is was it be a general contractor low bid type situation. So as a low as responsible a, bid. Low responsible bid. As a public entity, uh, you'd need to find a good reason to disqualify a, um, oh, a, a yeah, somebody who wasn't the low bid. 
Yeah. Not to say you can't. Okay. Um, you, you know, if you get a bid from you a home builder that's never done commercial work, or he's a flat work contractor who's never done commercial work, you can probably say, well, no, you're not qualified to do this scope of work. But you need a reason why you're going to disqualify him if you want to go that way. And a lot of times the bonding agencies will work that out for you because they're not going to bond somebody who require them to bond. Do you know what they're going to afford? Well, yeah. no. <laughs> that, that might not be enough. <laughs> Probably all depends on the judge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we have a lot of options, and uh, the work that Tim and TJ did for us, I think they did what we we asked them to do. And back when they did the bond, and this was a part of that bond issue that failed too. And it was something I think we felt like was an academic area that was was a high need and is still a high need. Uh, keep in mind, like they have. That bid sheet is all inclusive, everything. We could pull out things like the cabinets and paper them out of general fund if we wanted to. A lot of the equipment, supplies, I mean, it's it's all inclusive in that number, but we're always under budget, and we buy supplies and equipment out of our general fund budget. So, you know, that's that's one thing, you know, we could do also. Uh, but, you know, I think it's good food for thought for the board to look at. At least it gives you some, some numbers in, in black and white and, and uh, gives us something to, at least to talk about. And, you know, if we can't make a decision in December, you know, it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a hurried process anyway. We don't want to be in a situation where we think we have to hurry. We want to do this right when we ever do it. So, you know. The time frame is such that we can get it done this summer. That would be great. We may not. We may not want to consider science or Maybe we want to consider a different kind of bond too. I mean, just a lot of things on our plate. But I think that these gentlemen <coughs> did a nice job, and they worked with with uh, Mitch and Dave, and came out a couple of times and tolerated the need like normal. It was fun. They're fun to work with, and they did did a good job. And I Maybe. like looking at the schematics. That's all okay. Kate. Just point your magic wand and see what happens in the room would be nice enough to do. Maybe someday. We also appreciate you asking us. We had such a fun time until the night of the election. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then, if you think about the, the lift for the IT room, keep in mind that that's pretty much a mandate. We don't really have much choice on the on the IT room. We, we can get an extension. I know that they would give us an extension. They gave us two years. This is the first year. Next year would be the second year. I'm sure they would extend another year, but that's something with the lift we're going to have to do. I don't think it's feasible in my mind to put in a ramp and take up all the classroom space and cost you 20000 more than a, than a lift would cost. So the cost that, that these gentlemen proposed would be in with this particular bond, so that those costs, if we were going to do that item separate, would most likely be a little higher than what you're projecting. Yes, I'm sorry. I guess I was assuming that we would extend the platform to the east, move the steps to the east, and put the lift kind of on the north side of the platform. If we rotate the lift around and take up half the width of the stair or something, we can probably find a less expensive way to do it as well. But that was kind of the first rough, rough estimate. And if you want to look at that, I mean, if you want to look at it, we certainly can recess and go over and look at it too, if you'd like to. But we're just discussing tonight anyway. There's no no decisions to be made tonight, but certainly might want to take a look at it too. And we probably talked to this before, but what are, what are the funding options for this? For the science room yeah. renovations, yeah, I would, I would say that our option is mainly to do it out of our our building fund. Um, and in our building fund, we didn't when we levied our nickel for this year, we didn't necessarily have this particular project in mind because we didn't we didn't know at the time. A nickel gives us about uh, three hundred and fifty thousand a year. In a fund that already has about three hundred and 
50,000 to 400,000 in it. So if you're looking between now and next September, it's a fund of about $700,000. But we have some other expenses coming out of there, that, that pavement assessment, the, the new press box. Um, I was going to make a spreadsheet, and I will, and I'll try to get it to you guys in the next week or two. And then, you know, you just you never know, Jim. We've always tried to keep a balance in there of Two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, because you just never know when a roof is going to go. Right, right. And you know you can always do a QCAP bond for a roof, but you know, we're almost done paying our QCAP bonds, and our goal was to be we would never have to do those if we had a healthy building fund. Uh, other than that, I mean, I think that's about the only way to do it, unless you're going to go to some kind of a bond election, right? Just just do it out of your building. Fund. That's, you know, some of that stuff may qualify for a QCAP bond. There would be some specific things. I think the ventilation, certainly for the, mm -hmm. the shop area, you know, if we wanted to do a QCAP bond. But, uh, Naming right. rights, it could be the Mark Norvell Science Facility. Or that, that is a nice ring to it. <laughs> Yeah, you'd have to contribute a lot. Yeah. I'm thinking more like the Hugh Wilkins side. <laughs> so then the sprinkling, that's not included in this. Yeah. Uh, there's about 30,000 in the mechanical number, 27,000. Oh, that would cover the sprinkling. But that would, yeah. They, it would get the service to the building and sprinkle that room. I mean, that's kind of the expensive part, too. The, the rest of the, you know, once you have the water service here, I usually figure about two that. bucks a square foot to sprinkle existing buildings. So and if you want to, you know, this is about an 8,000 square foot building, so sooner or later you've got a $160,000, $170,000 to buy the house. If you can do it incrementally, that always helps. But you pay a little bit more to do it incrementally. If you're entering from the east, with the water service through the shop to the science room, it almost seems feasible to sprinkle the stuff along the way. Right. That's what we that's what we planned on. As long as you're coming, right. even you're coming through the home. locker rooms wouldn't be that disruptive. Yeah, that's, that's a great yeah. To, to do kind of along the way, the, that, the shop, shop area and, and those locker rooms. Right. Locker room. And you know, as we kind of thought about it, sprinkling that shop area and then the science classrooms, those are Two some of your higher risk areas anyway, and so um, you're really making progress there. We we probably need to get a hold of teacher pass to see what he said with me. Yeah. Hey, Any more questions for these gentlemen? We appreciate you coming out. Thanks for having me. You bet. Thank you. Between, between now and, and the December board meeting, is there anything in particular the board wants from me in relation to this project? Like an estimate of what our total building fund would be or other costs that we anticipate out of the building fund? Would that be, would that be a good look? Maybe give us a breakdown of what we've done the last two or three years. Because we've got the 2,000 or whatever up in there. Mm -hmm. We've got the press, the press box, which is about 20. Mm -hmm. um, Paving assessment. I don't remember. I can add to it. We're going to pretty much. We're going to go down to jail. They're working that whole way around the school. We did that for nothing. We're going to pay the taxes off of that. You know what? We got the paving assessment. It got, I think it came in the mail Friday, and I digging through my stuff today and I just didn't get it out because I didn't have it on the agenda, but I think we do have it. I didn't get it out, uh, so I'm not sure what it is. What, do you remember what they quoted us at that time, Kyle? 
That was that was the total. That was the total, and it was that was the total. But we could pay it over 15 years. 15 years, so that's. But I think there is interest. But I think it's maybe 3.1 percent interest or something. I'll 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 have that. I'll get that for you too. I'll call down. And get that. Last time that there's been like a major construction this building, I guess when it's nothing. So really, since the day it opened, there hasn't been like a all new boilers. Okay. We did put all new boilers in. That was about I want to say 102,000, maybe 102,000. No, like no wall thing there. I mean, everything's pretty much as. I don't think so, Jim, Dave. I don't think so. any major construction to this building does since you've been here. I'll go here when you talk, talk about any type of construction, but it was probably when part of the shop was taken away and a weight room was built. And that primarily was a wall. So, I mean, it. Yeah, just, you know, I will find that information and I'll get it to you soon. And if there's anything else that you want to know, uh, you just have to let me know, and I'll try to find it for you. Too. So then, uh, then uh, the gentleman will probably do another year of action. We'd have to look at and see the. Uh, you know, every, I think I would. I would tell you we'll have plenty of money in the building and fund to do it. I would tell you that, but I don't know between now and and May what can happen oh, I with the roof yeah. and and whatever. So it's just difficult to predict those things. I mean, we're in a lot better shape than a lot of districts, certainly. And when, if you can do something without a bond that you're paying over 20 years, I, I, I think that's great too. It's certainly a, a need, certainly a need, hard to argue, but I always have caution when it comes to spending money because you just never know. But. Certainly they did the job for us. When, when we did the bond, when we had the bond issue, they were allocating around four hundred to 450000 for the science renovation. So, so I, they, they came out pretty close to, to that. I was thinking it was less than that. And they, we can do it less than that now. I mean, this, this is basically saying we want a 21st century Chemistry, right. biology class. Kind of like when they started the bond process, you know, yeah. wish list. Wish list. Yeah. I mean, it's probably been, has it been paired some, though, probably, or not? Say that again. The, like when they did, started with the bond, it was a wish list. I mean, like everything in the gym and everything in the auditorium. Well, yeah, it, this yeah. is pretty much turnkey as far as we know for what they're talking about. But we, there's variations of levels, and we didn't go, we want the moon. We, right. we kind of went, if you were to walk into a high school lab, what would you expect? And these are the things you would expect to see safety-wise and facility-wise in any high school recommended. And so that's what we started with. And so that's basically what's in there. You, you can go from spending uh, that four-person lab station that they have in there, those are somewhere roughly around $2,500 a piece to $5,000 a piece, depending on what options you want with it. And you can go up to 10. You know, they make them where their, their, their height changes and they do all sorts of different things that you can do for handicap accessible and all sorts of stuff. But we kind of went run of the mill, what would you expect, what, what would we want to see. And also, if somebody walked in the room, they wouldn't go, wow, they cut every corner. You know, we wanted to do, you know, kind of the middle of the road, that's what we did. So. And I think the other thing is we looked at this not being a renovation project in another 10 years. Right. This is a project that's going to be around for the last another 27 years or longer and I, I think also the other thing is if you look facility wise and we were just talking about this a minute ago my chemistry lab had the lab stations put in from the old high school so of all the facilities we have here at the high school that that is one that has the oldest materials in it and really should probably be safety wise the newer stuff they were new when they were new, Doug. <laughs> 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 um, I think the other big thing is that 
good question because we, we don't know because we don't know whether the fire marshal is going to let us phase in the rest of the building. That would be the only question. He, they sound like they were talking. It's in the pocket. 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 Yeah. Well, I've been I've been here eight years and never seen the fire marshal in the building. Aren't you surprised they don't have, they don't make walkthroughs every no I'm glad they don't. Well, yeah, I, I know. I, they've never been, here, the they've never been here for the eight years I've been here. They've never been here. Or if they came here, they certainly didn't stop by and introduce themselves. <laughs> but I think it would be helpful. To Mark sends us this information if you would return kind of your feelings to uh, either myself or the Mark about whether you think we should move ahead or if we should wait. And that will kind of help determine our December agenda too. I guess I'll just throw it out there. I kind of think this is something the people I talked to were for or against the bonds that make a difference. This was one of the things that everybody was kind of consensus that they thought it was a, a good place to spend time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's kind of the take I got from it. So. Okay. Well, and, and, I, and my understanding correctly, the lift is something that we really, regardless of what we do with science rooms, the lift we need to do anyway, right? And we've agreed to do that. We, we were ordered by the Civil Rights Commission to do <laughs> right. it. Right. But, we, but we as a board mm -hmm. kind of committed that that's yeah. the project we were going to do. Right. So that's not really something we need to feedback on. I mean, that's a no, just that it'll, you know, they will tie it in with this project where we can separate it out right. and just do it on our own. Right, but yeah. the feedback that you're looking for before next Just month. be on the side so yeah. Here. Yeah, we pretty much have to do the lift. Right. I mean, I think okay. we're already just committed to that. You're right, so you're right. On, you're the, right. on the lift, is that something other schools have done that you know, we could do it as a side project and not get so detailed? We'll just have somebody, you know, from wherever come in and put a lift down and be done. Or is it something we need to have? You've got to have an architect design. You have to, okay. with the okay. public entity. You've got to have the architect design it. Then you're free to to go bid it out and I grant mean, it to anybody. Then the uh, next item was the Bell Street lighting. Yeah, I think we and I kind of, I really kind of discussed that. We're waiting, we're waiting on the city, and and I'll jump ahead, Dennis. And the same for the football bleachers. He came out and he looked at it, and and he gave me a picture and a proposal, and he told me he'd email me the costs, and I just still haven't got it from him. So I think we better just mark that off for right now. If you, just a reminder, we're, we've talked about replacing the one set of football bleachers in front of the concession stand. To accomplish two things: number one, handicap have a place for handicap accessible people to be able to watch from the bleachers. The only place we offer is the track, and again, that's by law. That's really not not permissible. They're supposed to be able to go where everybody else can go. And then the second thing is we, we had an incident where a child fell through fell through the bleachers, and so um, you know, that would, that would also be taken care of by that. So we're just moving this to the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Then we have the audit report. I, I just marked two things in the audit report. You really have all month to look this over if you want to. We normally approve at the December meeting if everyone's happy with it, but I got two, I think those are pink or salmon colored arrows, and that's Exhibit D. Exhibit D is all of our major funds, the top half being the top portion there being the receipts in all those funds for the year and then uh, the bottom being about the fourth line from the bottom is the total disbursements or expenditures the change in the fund balance the third line from the bottom and then our beginning and the ending of the year uh, fund balance and so if you remember when I when I first did our end of the year report I showed us taking in about 50,000 less in receipts than we had spent and after the audit gets through we actually took in 56,000 more than we spent and again that's because some of the September receipts are back taxes that he codes back into into this year so 
you can see there our, our fund balance in our special building fund, which is the third one over, is 450000 right now. Again, that doesn't, that doesn't include some of the things we know we're already spending out of that. But it also doesn't really include our nickel levy. Our nickel levy is, we'll, we'll get most of that in May and September of next year. If you remember when you set that levy in October, most of it comes in May and September of the following year. We are still getting some money off of our four cent levy though from the year before. We'll come in each month now a little bit. Of the time. And then uh, on the second pink, we did have an area of, of non-compliance. And it basically had to do with our student fee fund. Our student fee fund is where we pay driver's ed. We take in driver's ed fees and pay for the car and the gas. And then we also take in our laptop fees and then pay for repairs. And, and we actually had more repairs this year than we've normally had. And so we actually spent more than what we said in our budget document. So uh, Lynn and I are going to go back through that. We might have had some carryover from the previous year that we didn't get rid of. So we may have to amend our student fee budget for this year because this year I only have 15000 in it. So if we overspent last year, we may again this year. And of course, uh, the state auditor doesn't like it when you overspend your budget. And of course, we're not talking like our budget, general fund budget's eight and a half million. So when you're talking 25,000 or 16,000 is probably not a big deal, but we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't do it, and we did do it. So that's that's my error, and uh, so we do have an area of non-compliance that we'll we have to write a letter and tell them what we're going to do to to correct that. So, but um, you know, if you like reading, there it is for you for the month. But I highlighted two of those two of those areas. Success program membership. Every November we send you the spreadsheet and Mrs. Rayburn puts this together and she meets with the success superintendents, which if you remember success is a seven district cooperative. And so she meets with the superintendents and goes over the the enrollment and the staff and I just always give you a copy and take a look at it. It's great, it's a great program. It's it's one of the best in the state of Nebraska for uh, educating uh, these kind of uh, children and we do a great job with it and uh, Shell is certainly responsible for that and, and uh, ESU 6 they do do a super, super job. I'm just giving you the enrollment in success 1 and 2 of course is in the elementary success 3 is in the middle school and then success 4 is, is here at the high school and then the type that's our uh, ages 3 and 4 students and then the home base is our zero to two students. And it seems like our zero to two students grows every year. So, you know, but we're just better at identifying problems at that age. Doctors are better and parents are better. And we're just better at identifying. So, Michelle, anything you'd like to, to add? No, just that I would did of that. And we, and we also see kind of a um, ebb and flow to when referrals happen. We'll see kind of a peak here, it seems, after the holidays. I think families get together and give each other feedback. That's, you know, they talk on the phone to grandma. And so we'll see kind of a peak after the holidays. And then we see another one, I think, um, towards the end of the year. I think that's when families are trying to make those decisions about kindergarten and where their child's at developmentally. So there is some ebb and, ebb and flow to those, those referral, that referral process. But, um, I agree. I think we're, we're doing better at it. That's a subcomponent of the ILCB committee is uh, improving the children, which is improving learning for children with disabilities. And um, part of that in the zero, is targeting zero to three and involving the early childhood special ed providers more consistently on the teams. And I think we're doing a much better job with job that. So. I'm just asked a question this week and I didn't know how to answer it. Casey drives the McCool Junction bus with students and they go down to the Congo uh -huh. Church. And mm -hmm. why the McCool Junction bus? Because we have, it has a lift and um, we have a student that comes from McCool and, and uh, actually we have more than one student. We have one, a success student um, and we also, they also will use it for tight. And they switch vehicles so that we have use of that all day long to use the lift um, to go back and forth to job sites. And so it's basically um, one of the give and takes with the enrollment piece that McCool has said 
you know, you're serving our kids and you help with transportation in a lot of ways and we targeted buying this bus to serve serve that population. So so the driver le um, will leave the bus and go. We've done that before. And then also, um, Sydney Fouts, you'll see her name is a paraeducator. She's certified to drive a bus and a para, so they'll let her also, you know, use a vehicle to bring it, stay at school, and then take the student home with her. So it's just a nice convenience piece to um, use it to, for all of our kids. And we could use our bus, but it, it does the tight routes, and so it's not always available during the day. Yeah, so. those lift buses are, you know, when you when you need them, <laughs> you need them at the same times for dismissals and, and those kinds of things. So yeah, that's just a nice, a nice thing that McCool lets us do. No clue. Yeah, that's why. And that's one of the, that you mentioned that, um, that's one of the, the success program at the high school level does a lot with, um, uh, and we have great support from the community for job sites. And so we have several paid job sites, um, and the kids can go out and get have some job coaching uh, and uh, gain some independence and some skills. So that bus, that's why those that bus and, and, and our other vehicles are seen out so much more is because we're coming and going to. So you're right, the UCC church is one um, of the sites, and we do um, cleaning services there. So We also have an apartment where they learn to cook. And so they're cleaning. shuttling back and forth, that's, um, which makes that, that's why we also have two teachers. I mean, granted, that's the larger because we're serving kids essentially can be from age 14 through 21, so a larger span, and also they're just, they're coming and going so much more to the, we call it apartment lab. So they go there and, and they actually have class time at the apartment and then they're coming and going from job site. So it takes more bodies for supervision to, to man that kind of a schedule when you're coming off, off and on campus. That's why it says McCool on the side. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And we have a board evaluation process. I think Jody enclosed it, did she not? And I'll just read you our policy. It just says the board shall at least annually complete an evaluation of its own performance. The performance evaluation form shall be completed by each board member during the month of December. Results of the evaluation shall be reviewed at the regular meeting in January. Areas of strength and weaknesses shall be identified and improvement goals formulated. So, you know, you can, you can and turn in your evaluations to Dennis or one of you, but Jody would compile them for you too if you'd like her to, and I think she's done that in the past. And yeah, she does a good job. Is this the form that we've used in the past? Mm -hmm. That's the same one I ever I don't remember. I think Sean is just new a couple of years, right? Yeah. Yeah, look at him, guys. Yeah. And Sean is president. Did she send this one online? Is that how she did that? If you want to change I think, it, I, think so. I have no problems with it. I think you can do it. She'll. This is an example. She'll send it to you by email, and you can you can do it by clicking and send it back to her. I think that's how. That would that would be what I'd recommend. I'll remind her, but I'm sure she's probably planning on doing that anyway. Okay. And review the board policy numbers. We have three policies that had been checked 5210 5210 is about grading and, and I don't I don't want to change the policy the policy is fine I just wanted to kind of give you a, a heads up we have been we have been working we have a committee of 10 people uh, six teachers four administrators that have been working on trying to uh, uh, I don't know the best word to use but to consolidate our grading practices to be more uniform from grades 3 through 12. Grades K1 and 2, they do a lot of satisfactory and unsatisfactory, but in grades 3 through 12, we have a wide array of what people do to, to, to assign a grade. Certainly, we're not changing the fact that an A is 94 to 100 and all that, but just a little bit more modification of, of how we grade. We think when a, when a, when a parent walks into parent-teachers conference, and, and goes to a science teacher and the science teacher has 85% for that student. When they walk over to the English teacher and the English teacher has 85%, those two things should mean the same. They should mean the same. That, that it should mean that that student has mastered 85% of the curriculum in, the, in that course. And, and I guess it's our feeling is we're not sure that that's happening now because everybody does things differently. Okay? And maybe, maybe some teachers give extra credit. 
and maybe some teachers are quick to give zeros. And you know, we've talked in committee how there's there's you know there's eight ways to get an A and a B and a C and a D, but 69 ways to get an F from zero to 69, and how a zero can really you know disparage this the grading scale, and that 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 maybe we take off points for a student that forgot to write their name on the paper. Well, does that assess what they know? You know, so we're we're trying to put all of those things together and the fact that practice, practice, the daily the daily work, the practice, the homework, maybe shouldn't count as much as the actual assessment, the quiz, and the test. That that a student should be able to practice and screw up now and then while they're learning and not have that part hurt their grade. So we're we're we've had it's been it's been, and these three have been part of it. It's been, uh, it's been two years, getting close to two years of, of great work, and and I don't think I don't think it's, you know, we're gonna we're gonna show the board what we're doing. I mean, this is your policy, so you don't really have a lot of guidance, cracking the whip, and telling us what to do anyway. But we want to share it with you what we're doing, because we want to put it in place for next year. We're still pounding out a few a few nuts and bolts and we'll probably bring some of the committee to go through it with you. But we've had great, great discussion, great interaction. We we started with a book by Ken O'Connor and I can't remember the title. Grading for Learning. Grading for Learning. Beautiful. And uh, we don't think it'll really upset the apple cart and we think that it's really going to be very, very good for, for kids and, and certainly good for our staff and we think once parents get used to the idea that there's a course syllabus and we're telling them that this test counts so much percent, and these quizzes are this percent, and it's spelled out in every classroom. And I, we think it's it's going to be beneficial, and it'll all be online so people can see it. And uh, I think it'll be good. They'll also kids will get an opportunity to retake a summative assessment. They get an opportunity to take it over again with some reteaching. Okay, not just take it over again and hope that they do better, but there will be some reteaching. Mm -hmm. So. It's just been it's been a lot of good. It's been very very good. And, um, so when I saw the grading policy and I read through it, it doesn't it's nothing that would contradict this, but it just it's something that we'll we'll present to you later. Uh, fifty two forty two, Jim. Do you got fifty two forty two in front of you there? Yeah, I do. I, I would suggest to the board that we probably don't need this policy anymore. Can you see a reason that we would need it, or do we want to make some adjustments to it, Jim? With Probably the biggest thing that kids use this is when they want they wanted to leave the military second semester. Um, more cases than not, I, that's what I remember it being used for. Not so much for a kid going on to a college to start second semester, but towards the military. When we when we had block schedule, we had a we had a significant amount of kids that may qualify for graduating at December. Right? And we still could. Right. But without block scheduling it's probably not going to happen as often. You know? Probably not as frequent. Because with government being a semester class, unless they yeah. take it as a junior right. and government's required. They would have to have a lot of plan. I mean they would have to have this well thought out and planned. So the reason I brought it here is was whether the board or you were interested in making any adjustments to it whatsoever, or is it fine the way it is? That's the main thing. The only thing I remember was, I don't know why it's coming up in my head, this, but we had the one individual that went military, and then there was an issue about whether he could wear, or he wanted to wear his dress blues and not the robe. That's the only thing I could think of. Right? I think we allowed that. And we allowed it. We allowed it. Yeah. 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 That's the only thing I would yeah. always say that that, over, that yeah. trumps everything. So the, the dates that are still there are still valid, the October 1? and the I, think, I think the dates are valid from the standpoint that it makes the child and parents do a lot of planning yeah. and notifies the board and the school district well in advance. Okay. The last one is 5325, and and you know you may not even be aware that we have this kind of a a policy, but uh, I think it is important um, about giving gifts to school personnel. 
certainly, you know, there's a there's an implied perception there that when you give someone a gift, maybe you want something in return, you know, a better grade for your son or daughter or a starting position on the team or so. I mean, we just stay away from those things just because of the implied persona. There are some exceptions in there and, uh, you know, we did, we did have a situation a couple years ago where a family gave all the wrestling team a jacket and the coaches a jacket, didn't go through the school, didn't go through Mr. Malone and, and caused an issue, causes an issue with other team, school, students on another team that says, why don't we get a jacket? Well, it was the parents that donated it. Second thing was, you know, our coaches, they're not to accept a gift, and they did, and so we've, we've had a long conversation. I think the intent was, the intent was to do something nice, but they just didn't follow the right the right procedures to do that and so we've kind of we've had that you know and it, and it sounds innocent but I'm but I'm telling you those the kind of things that seem reasonable aren't always reasonable I mean it just it is improper to accept gifts in those situations so. it's you have to be above reproach yeah and that's the toughest thing especially so, when you got people who are great stuff and yeah. We have a procedure that they can go through yeah. to get that done, and they just need to follow the procedure. So I just I just highlighted that because I don't want to change it, but I just want to make you aware of we've had an issue with it, and so hopefully, hopefully the board still supports that. If you don't support it, we should get rid of the policy. But uh, I think it is important to have it. So. Okay, then we go to superintendent evaluation. We need a motion to go into the next session for a um, question and answer period. So we have a motion for the second by the second by the board of For the purpose of uh, personnel evaluation. Move by who and second by who? It's moved by Mark and second by Dave. And the motion was what? Do an executive session or you discuss the superintendent evaluation at 923. Yes. 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 Yes.